So <clears throat> going deeper into the ecosystem soft the evolution, so introducing these terms and concepts uh, from the perspective of timeline, from the perspective of uh, of ecosystem a little bit, but let's take a, a bit deeper dive again. with the help of some visualization. And the key really for us is to try to make this as, <clears throat> as technically or as technical as we dare or think that makes sense for them to be valuable, but not any deeper than that. And on the other side, connect as much of that non-technical business logic um, around these conversations as possible to make sure that if we have an ecosystem operator team from non-technical and technical side listening this together, um, repeat it as a, in a, being a digital format as many times as needed, <coughs> as often as needed, and whenever there's a question on the specific topic, to try to find it from the content and research further or ask for, ask for deeper details. Uh, that's the, the function of, of this content that we are providing. So how does the transition to serverless architecture from the timeline of having the monotonic to, to mobile APIs to, to microservices into serverless, how does it look like, like in a visual sense? <clears throat> so really to enable that uh, efficient, collaborative, secure and flexible development that the ecosystem needs and how to get there. So this is to show again a little bit, a, a bit more uh, information including a monotonic application. So we have the database, so we can all understand it's, you know, it's a bucket of where all the information goes, simplified sense. The, we have the web user interface. We have the user interface, it doesn't need to be web, but we have the interface that we use to interact as a normal user. Uh, we have the business logic. So, you know, it can be hard coded into the system or it can be like, you know, spreadsheet. There isn't much business, there are some, but there isn't much business logic. You can use spreadsheets in many different ways. It's a very flexible tool or something like Trello. You can use that many different ways. So you need to kind of design your own rules, how you agree to use things. Or you can have software that, you know, it only does what it's supposed to do and that's it. It's very business logic is tight and it can be taken <coughs> into the uh, database level as well. Then you have the software features that actually makes all of those things work. This is the business logic and these are functions that make it work. And then you have, you know, the layer between like the software communicating with the database, you know, data in, data out, data changed, uh, and that's it. And, you know, those commands come from the user interface, enter this, save, you know, report, pull this, calculate me something. And that is like one big application. So for, for, for these applications to run, so the monotonic world is, means that you need your own server. So where you create your server setup, whether it's a physical or virtual, doesn't really matter. But if you need to have a server, you create it uh, or you put it in place, you set up, you install server operating system, the same way as you, know, you put Linux or Microsoft or Apple, where then this uh, application runs. You put other sort of server softwares, you know, uh, whatever, depending on what the software needs to run, um, supporting, supporting softwares uh, for the main software. You need to manage updates. So not only updates for the software, if you introduce new features, but actually you need to update the, the uh, server's software as well. The same way as you need to, you know, in your phone, you need to have a new operating system. Uh, in the server, you need to update the operating system as well, which is separate from the actual application that the server is running. 
And you need to make sure that if there's a lot of users, that the server has enough processing capacity and that it can serve all those users. So if you get, you know, thousand users looking at it at the same time, um, and that still happens. It was, it was, you know, from the comedy series Friends just recently. This Rachel, the actor that uh, the actor who uh, had the character Rachel there, uh, she joined Instagram <laughs> just recently and posted a, a photo of the, the Friends actors together, and the cast of Friends together, and it's been like supposedly decades, and the Instagram crashed because so many people wanted to see that picture. So it does still happen, but it means that the, 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 the software server setup was not uh, capable of, of balancing that, that load. But the point being that, that it's not only the software that runs there, but also where the software runs. And this is the monotonic application setup. And then where the change started to happen, uh, basically it was one of the, the big forces that forced the application programming interface, the API development to, to really get into high gear was when mobile apps were introduced. So as normal users, we don't really think about much what does it mean when we have our own app on the phone versus if we use this, you know, the, the browser to go to mobile website of the same service. So we can see that the other one maybe works better, faster, it, it's more convenient, it can do a bit more. The other one I have to go through a software uh, a browser and I need to type the URL and I can use and you know it kind of loads weird or uh, it's not fully as convenient, but what it meant from architecture perspective is that that mobile app is an entirely separate application that needs to interact with the main server, not through a browser, not through a web user interface, but it needs this application interface to interact and move data and information between the mobile application and the server side application. And because of that, the API development started to grow significantly because now there was more and more apps and you could win new business by developing these apps but now you need to have APIs pretty much in every app. The only really common things here was the data model. So the data model is basically the, the, the information structure how and what data is and can be stored into database regardless of you know, whether it's MySQL, MongoDB or whatnot, but the data model. So basically everything is built around processing information, putting information in, taking information out. And, uh, and, but the data model is the key piece that is relevant regardless of how old the applications are, the data model is relevant. And it's a, it's a potentially common thing. And that's why we are focusing so much uh, to start and promote the open standard around data model. It's because it's most relevant to everyone. And at the same time, it's the simplest and the lightest and the most logically understandable piece of every software. Because data is information, data is KPIs and, and so forth. But now, because we, the APIs started to emerge, uh, it was a business decision to open those APIs for other use than on mobile application use as well. So the likes of Twitter, Facebook, you know, Google, of course they may have had APIs earlier as well, but it really started to become a norm with, amongst other developers, amongst startups as well to utilize APIs of others to build totally new softwares. So of course, when there was limited APIs available, it was limited innovation potential of what type of data and software can be built. 
But as more and more software came out, more and more applications came out, the faster it was for any new company to develop a new software that doesn't have to have those features in the, their own software. They don't have to build it. They borrow or use under business terms um, functions and features and data of another application. So uh, a mobile apps was a big change in introducing this. So another change was that, uh, that it started to make sense to separate the database from the application because more flexibility, uh, not tying that into uh, business logic and everything into one software. So really separating the, uh, the database out of being like a, a business logic level tied into the actual software. And one big piece of, of uh, the complexity of the software uh, was then that everything was bundled in. And even before the database was separated, and this picture actually should also include the web interface, it's all kind of software code that would have like a significant amount of dependencies. So you can think of like a business process chart that's have a lot of overlapping, you know, this goes there and this goes there. And if I remove this, then the whole software breaks. So it's this kind of a, a challenge of a spaghetti code, meaning that everything is dependent on everything. And that made the software development a very accurate and very delicate process. And that's why the box exists so, so heavily, why software is like you improve the user logging system and then the, the, the mails don't work anymore. Like totally feeling that how does this, I worked here, but something else breaks here. So it's because the software uh, dependencies are very complex. So uh, the next level was to break that spaghetti code into smaller pieces of spaghetti and uh, separate the data also into different types of data storage formats uh, into having databases or databases as a service, having uh, you know, more structured data, more unstructured data formats. And now the application programming interface actually became more also its own thing to develop because it's no longer just serving the mobile apps, it's all serving all other apps so a more uh, application level standard needed to start develop and improve on, on its own as being able to do the applic uh, application programming interface activities efficiently so it became more of its own application as well to cater just these connectivities a key piece adding to the common side was that now also the business logic was more separated because now the business logic was no longer hard coded into one big giant application but it was actually distributed and because of the apis now you could create a other new business logic if you could run it just using the api uh, so that you could use software features from other applications uh, or data from other applications and now you can think of new business logic and you are no longer limited to uh, just for your monotonic uh, software service or monotonic software <clears throat> so now these were called microservices and i would say maturity of existing applications out there uh, in, if they are not SaaS software if they are like locally in, well, in local custom software and even some of the new software still being built are not even microservices level so so this what happens in technology development will eventually deploy into the kind of real world with uh, uh, with the delay but these are no longer like these are good practices they are no longer best practices anymore uh, but the, the, the ones before are no longer even good practices. They are like old practices. 
So the whole point is if building anything new is that also need to think of even further than this and definitely don't look at building monotonic applications. So still spaghetti, but now less. So it's more manageable, the software, because it's separated into uh, more manageable pieces. And then the serverless is then what on the timeline you had there, you know, now relevant now, 2018, 19, going forward, is more and more on serverless. So that's all what Microsoft is doing, IBM is doing, Google is doing, Amazon is leading um, on the technology. And what that takes into account, here you still have ser servers. So basically here you have the server, here you still have servers running those microservices. When you move here, the server is gone. So the point being that you no longer as an application developer, application uh, uh, operator, uh, the one who runs the software, you don't no longer need to worry about the operating system, updating the operating system, the capacity of the server. You only have to think of the actual application functions and uh, the overall architecture. So now, what has happened in the commons side, what has come more possible, is in addition to data model and in addition, in addition to business logic, now with more standards, you can build uh, API documentation as a, as a commons for, for shared business logic use. You can share individual software functions instead of full complete softwares. And you can also uh, share users and data by sharing them through your application to other. And the most normal uses used all the time is Facebook logging, uh, Google logging, uh, LinkedIn logging, uh, and so forth. So that's sharing users. So there are applications out there that they don't even have a way to register in any which way than through Facebook or Google. Now, that's a ex case example of where that is uh, applied massively, but that's not the recommended model for ecosystems because that keeps feeding them more information only. It's not to say don't include it, but it's, it's to say don't make that the only option because there are also uh, people who opt out from those services. So you need to build something more neutral, but globally scalable and shared and an architecture to support that and that's where we we start and support it's to build the right options and the right uh, privacy controls that are decided locally understood locally and supported locally so this locally can be in a city in a country level those are all local decisions to be made we just to communicate what makes uh, logical sense and how they should be considered. So that <clears throat> uh, the technical stuff doesn't get into the way of understanding what makes business logic and what needs uh, logic from economic development perspective. So serverless, no spaghetti code anymore. And the point being, because you can basically make them as simple or as uh, big as you want. So it can include simple thing, you know, submit and it just, you know, does that. It does nothing else than submit. Uh, so one click and it does like two lines of code, that's it. Or it can be, you know, 10 lines of code, it can be more. But the point is that it's so much smaller so much more simpler and there is also no need to run through APIs to connect these functions. Um, so, so it has much more simpler interfaces for these to connect, but they are interfaces nevertheless. They are not, you know, direct dependencies. They all go through a logical connection. And with this setup now, we can create all the new types of ecosystem applications, basically meaning that 
on top of that architecture that can be put in place. It doesn't need uh, a, this thinking that we need to create an application, but we just need to create a new interface into this existing architecture and data and features. And that's the, also the opportunity that all the startups have. So the startups don't need to think of application development based on uh, that we need to build a full monotonic application. They can just build an interface application that pulls all the features and does everything on top of someone else's APIs. Of course, there's business reasons why you want to do something of your own and why do you want to build you know, layers, why do you also want to have your own data. But the point, again, is to go through from the technical perspective of what's possible and what's logical and what is fitting and what is the, the current um, most mature and most applicable solutions that also really make the ecosystem infrastructures possible in a whole different way. So if we go and look at where we started 2011, 2012 with the ecosystem application, these were not available. <clears throat> so building a monotonic application to cater for entire ecosystem need was not a working model. But still, in many ecosystems, um, because there is not uh, enough understanding of the digital transformation, digital economy, and the technologies that run them, still, in many places, people are starting to build a monotonic applications for ecosystem needs uh, unknowingly, because those who order the software, the business side, don't know really what the technologies is and what is suitable. <clears throat> and if the, tech, uh, the software providers are not on top of their game, meaning that they are being lazy to learn new software or new architectures, because it's a significant learning curve to move into this. Uh, but those who have just started with the new, like anything in the world, some don't have to unlearn to learn. They just start from whatever is the current. <clears throat> uh, then the whole outcome can be that there's you know, millions spent in a structure unknowingly that is going to be outdated and just pulled to the trash. Just because not having uh, enough of the understanding of the digital economy and digital transformation in practical level to connect enough different pieces to make sense <clears throat> in a way that both technical and business, non-technical, can look at this information together and have a mutual understanding, building conversations around that, with or without our support. The key for us is to make this available, to make it scalable, to make it digital, digital to make it repeatable, uh, to have this information. And really, it's, it's no more spaghetti code. So do not build these monotonic uh, solutions. If you have them, that's not a problem. They keep running, for sure, as long as the servers are updated and so forth. But if you need to do significant development efforts to improve them, you should definitely consider uh, replacing and starting fresh. Uh, we did this in a, in a, after having spent a few millions of euros in the software over, not through just startup commons, but also through other companies. Uh, you can read our history from our website if you're interested uh, to, to learn more about that, just to decide that it's no longer functional. And we cannot, uh, even if we know it works, even if there were where people wanted to buy from us, we said we cannot sell this anymore. We cannot introduce this as a concept. It simply doesn't work. It's a bad move to do that. <clears throat> so here is a kind of a summary of this transition from monotonic architecture. What are the commons to be shared, starting from data model, uh, and then introducing more and more of shareable elements and through microservices architecture to serverless architecture. And uh, and this goes uh, looking of 
these details in the, in the timeline of the global application development. So it's all about unbundling. So if we look at this, it's kind of unbundling it into more logical pieces uh, that work more independently instead of spaghetti. So initially starting from mobile app requiring that API connection, user interface where they're separated from the backend to support growing number of different types of user interfaces, not only mobile apps, smart TVs, smart watches, voices. So now we started to have more and more applications that needed to communicate with the same service. You can look, look Netflix from multiple different devices with your same account. Then you started to separate content from the specific user interfaces. So content and data models, backend functionalities. So dividing one big giant piece of uh, spaghetti into functional and divide it into smaller modules, the microservices and ultimately serverless that remove the whole need to maintain a server at all. Not even a physical, not first physical server to virtual server to serverless, no server worries needed. Unlimited scaling of capacity uh, to any number of users. So doesn't need to have big server running all the time. If no users, only use that capacity. If more users, automatic scaling. Um, so serverless brings um, all of these uh, options and those are the rational and logic why they have developed these technologies. <clears throat> Um, serverless on its own is not owned by anyone, it's open source. So serverless.com, if you want to read more, you can watch YouTube videos about these topics uh, and so forth. The serverless itself is, uh, is a concept uh, and an there's an open source um, development of the core functionalities and everything around it. So it's not uh, it's, it's the way the technologies work, uh, develop at best. Business logic separated from databases, so no need to think of SQL, uh, a single query language, no need to, to have no SQL databases, just data as a service. So, uh, and, and separate structure around how that data goes in and out uh, without tying business logic around it at a uh, database level. Dynamic multi-stakeholder and multi-developer friendly service with single digits millisecond latency at any scale. So this is the, the, the serverless capacity. So quick response, I ask and I get response. Globally available, like in any time zone, you have serverless setups, uh, clouds that you can use. There's multiple cloud providers. The serverless itself is open source. Uh, structure, so it's not someone's proprietary, you know, architectural technology. And unlimited scale. Doesn't matter if suddenly you have, you know, super exciting startup that fixes, you know, the climate change issue, and two billion people, boom, come there to what's what it is. I don't know if it scales that far, but anyway. <clears throat> So the business and data logic design at front end level, not deep in the system with complex dependency. So that is very much aligned with that dev, uh, no box perspective that it's no longer about uh, thinking, you know, the, the business side with the software developer side to the server side. But because these pieces can really be separated and they can be changed, I think it's really important that everyone gets those mindsets so that uh, that's the digital transformation. More and more people understanding enough, not all the details, don't need to know how to code, don't need to know how to program, but need to understand how this works, what are the benefits. So obviously this is if you're supporting startups, you should know this. If you are building your own support services, you should know this. Um, if you are actually building those software, you definitely should know this. If you are buying, spending public money budgets, you know, building architectures and systems, you should know this. Uh, so there isn't really 
uh, where this level of understanding would not be relevant going forward, understanding how a uh, digital economy works. What's behind the user interface? Disruptive live lower cost. So cloud resources, server maintenance, development coordination, Q&A, standardiza standardization, visibility. So we should, like in many places, when things get better, they cost more. But the technology is the weird place where things get better and they cost less. That's the, probably the only, only thing that where that actually works. Probably there are others as well, but it's the Moore's law, but it's not only the power of processor. It's all of the technologies combined. <clears throat> is that things get better, they get faster, they scale better. Uh, ways to produce gets cheaper, faster. And all of these create more and more opportunities, of course, for new innovations, for new startups. Uh, but the, the worrying part really is that the world around them the ecosystem that supports them in case of startup ecosystems is extremely analog. Like I said, sports, way more digital. Factories, way more digital. You can look at Siemens, digital twins, concepts, uh, way more. You take gambling, extremely, extremely. You take the, you know, the Las Vegas casino system, extremely connected. The one place where we should solve the climate problem, where we should solve, you know, the jobs, economic stability, improve uh, citizen services, uh, bring innovation, uh, grow our economy, fight the digital development outside of our economy, monetizing our economies. We 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 really need to to get on board with the technology developments and apply the types of infrastructures that make sense to really genuinely develop the, our eco, uh, ecosystems. And all of this information is available. We know that the key challenge uh, why we exist also, uh, why we do this, is that it's not packaged in a format that connects enough different aspects and put it in a framework. Uh, so it makes sense end to end from how to build a startup to development phases of a startup to what services cater for what to what measure from that process what systems to use what information is valuable how to run that technology what is technology development um, so that's why we want to bring this information available so faster time to market single digit millisecond latency, high availability and scalability. So now when we have gone through uh, the rationale, the key terminologies, and uh, just as a reminder, uh, we have of course this all recorded so you can replay them as many times as needed. Uh, recommend highly to take any piece, any term, out of the, the context, if you feel you don't have enough knowledge in our presentation, put it in YouTube, watch any videos that come on the top list. There's an algorithm catering you the best ones anyway. <clears throat> Look, a couple of those videos over time, more and more understanding will piece out. That's how we built the knowledge as well through our experience and learning from multiple perspectives. Another good way is put the term in the Google alert system. So Google alert is where you can put any search term and have it feed you information whenever new content come available that Google recognize or re registers important enough. Put digital transformation there into uh, quotes and have that feed you new articles every week automatically to your inbox. You don't have to read, you know, one month, two months, every week, you read two, three articles, you build a, enough understanding of what digital transformation means in practice. What are the challenges? You put API economy, same thing. You put data economy, you put platform economy, it keeps feeding the information. So 
revisit as often as needed. Put forever any term that you want to improve your perspective, just one term. You will get articles that are written around that term from multiple perspectives over the weeks. You can get daily alerts if you want, but you need to let your brain to consume the knowledge as well. <clears throat> okay, so having established this space, now how to transform into open to business from your current position. <clears throat> So again, a little bit of different perspective, but we start from this is the normal view for us in a, in a normal users, business, uh, non-technical use is that we see the interface, we know what we can do with it. If we want to learn, we can use instructions and so forth, but we don't see what's behind. So the software really looks like this. It's like, you know, it's like that package that we used to go to, you know, the store to buy Microsoft Office new version. You know, it was intentionally packed in a box to make it tangible, to make the software like physical element. But that mindset has transferred uh, for the most of the people. How we think of software, it's you know piece of uh, package. Uh, and how, for example, organizations have gone through, okay, this software is no, not good enough anymore. How do we do that? It used to be that, well, we replace with another software. And again, a box, we remove the old and we install the new. And it didn't matter whether it's a CRM system running on the cloud, it was the same thing. We changed the provider. And the big problem is that everything changed, like these are now LinkedIn and Facebook, just because it's I want to put something there, but this think of it, this CRM one, and now some software guy kind of says, I said it to CRM two, it's better. You go through that, now you have to re relearn everything. And this is where the friction for the change come from. People don't want that. You have to learn new things just because you change software. So this is the good thing that no longer do you need to think of this. Like if you think, when you use Google services, how often have you ever had to change the whole interface? Right? It's iterative. Facebook, Amazon, LinkedIn, Google, they intentionally don't change because they don't have it, because it's you know, open for everyone. They can't change the whole user interface. Like Skype is wild now. They constantly change the, almost the entire interface. It's crazy. But in general, there's the whole point because then you don't have to educate people, but you still bring new features, you still improve it, but it happens behind the user interface. So the application again, user interface software. So if, you, if this is your starting point, then the question is, what do you need to do to move forward from this? So now you introduce the API, right? That doesn't yet require you to, uh, uh, to redo the whole software. You just bring the API into the picture and you decide what data you want to make open to others and so forth. So this is a, just no API, API. <clears throat> but of course, what are the remaining problems after that? When you introduce an API, you have to create documentation, you have to create the business terms, you have to create a, a developer website, basically, where that information resigns so that they know that A, your API exists, that they know how they can use it, uh, what business terms do they have to accept, do they have to pay to use it. That's part of the sustainability, which is the module four topic, is that uh, this can bring you revenues to help uh, sustain ecosystem development support functions or start contributing for sustaining them or more. But you still have <clears throat> the problem of the software spaghetti code. You still have the server to maintain. <coughs> and it doesn't matter whether this software is like physically in your use or whether it's a software that comes from your provider. Wherever that is, it needs to be fixed. Um, and if it's cloud software, it's like Meetup, Facebook, yeah. Um, 
Eventbrite, like those already have this and they work, but the thing is that they are not in the control to introduce new features if needed. So that's the balance of like, pick, like building the puzzle for the ecosystem level. But anyway, if the starting point is the monolithic application, you start from here, you introduce the API, you need to build documentation, support, okay, now it seems like a lot, but it's basically introducing yourself open to business in the like economy or your service. To fix this, next phase would be to move into the serverless. And of course, you would still have to have uh, also the, uh, the documentation part in this setup if you serve outside. Um, is serverless and open. So now you have moved from here step by step into this setup, but you don't have to change your AP, uh, your user interface. So you can keep that the same. So you just change the things on the background. And you can introduce software features from outside to enhance your software. But the key is that you don't have to go through retraining all the, the people if you have like a, a 10 people, 100 people, 10,000 people organization regardless. The big cost factor comes if you actually change the application, the user interface. Retrain everything, train people from new processes, how the software works. Motivate them to accept the new software, have a big change management, you know, operations. No, there is no need for that anymore. <clears throat> make it iterative on the user side, step by step, like the whole internet applications work these days for consumers, and then understand how to work on the back end. Now, this is the change flow, and what we can introduce to help in between is to bring uh, a solution like Ecosystem OS that doesn't require that the connection has to be at API level. It can be, you know, sending Excel sheets. It can be submitting an event information. Much simpler systems and APIs can be built to connect uh, to in, uh, data sharing infrastructure. And then uh, that other connection to connect your own application even you can pull information through API to feed into your software in different ways. Or, uh, or then uh, when other applications are connecting with your data. So this is not the optimal solution. Also, this is the type of bridging solution to get faster moving forward while you then take your time or your, your developers take time to update your application in a nat natural evolution way when the, just all the software pieces get so old that it just needs to be redone anyway. The key part here is that don't need to have API, don't need to support API, don't need to build documentation for that because that's part of the commons part that available with the same data model but only if you make that data available and only on the terms that you make it available. But how to access it, how to use it is standardized on the other side and therefore we can build uh, common documentation, common APIs together collaboratively with all of the different ecosystem actors in different ecosystems globally. So this is a, a, a shortcut way uh, to approach uh, and it's not meant to replace, but give a, a faster step forward and give time to make changes uh, uh, on, on, the, on the more legacy applications. <clears throat> and then finally, on the ecosystem user account side. So this is the part then making the, the, the shared users possible and making the data portable on the, the customer side. Uh, and here, a big factor, enabling factor, is the regulatory development. So this is one of the 
most latest uh, significant technology impacting regulation that has hit the the the, the world in in decades, uh, and uh, it's a significant because it is a regulation that takes into account the bad developments that has happened uh, with the, the platform business models and, and network effects uh, run by Facebooks and Googles and so forth, creating excellent services with these iterative uh, um, user interface improvements uh, while doing the, you know, the, the connectivity and, and connecting different applications and improving everything. As a side product, shared user base has given them enormous amounts of data about individuals and, and we have discussed that in I think module one or module two uh, but the regulation around data privacy and, uh, and protecting individuals right to their own data uh, specifically GDPR uh, most known globally uh, initiated from Europe uh, but similar regulations are developing everywhere in the world. So CCPA is a consumer, um, uh, what is that? California Consumer Protection Act. Uh, and, uh, and it really is to, to do, it's very similar to GDPR. It's moving forward, uh, coming to effect in California uh, next year, 2020, uh, basically meaning that individuals should have right to their own data and they should uh, be able to get it. They should have control of how it's used much more than now, not only tick box, but every time data is used, they should ask permission again, uh, various other things. Why California is significant, of course, because Silicon Valley is there. So all of the big companies te around technology innovation are running uh, basically from California. Uh, even if they are Delaware registered, they are operating mainly from California under California state law. <clears throat> so it's significant. Of course, GDPR is already in effect in whole Europe since, uh, since last year, 2018. Uh, more than a year now, uh, and that is uh, more than 500 million users. And similar are happening in Japan, in, in Brazil, uh, in Canada, uh, and so forth. So this is really taking into control of how users can be shared, how users' data can be shared, what controls the individuals have, and so forth. And this is really positive regulation. Uh, it's really important and it's really future oriented. And it affects private companies and public sector equally alike. So, so it's, it's really uh, significant. And one of the key points is exactly what we want in the ecosystem when we think of the ecosystem support functions. We want to know about the individuals, we want to know about the startups. We want them to be able to, because I can't say if I'm or support organization A and here's support organization B, it's very hard for me to share customer data with that other organization. But if we give it to the individual and the individual takes it to another service, that's their full right. And now regulation is bringing it that right uh, into under regulation so that the companies no longer can say no. That, and they even have to make it technically available, possible. So the data cannot be a PDF print. It has to be in a technical readable format. That's what the regulation in Europe says. So <clears throat> it's really to enable this data portability. And the data is not only what the individual gives themselves, but it's also information about them. Uh, and of course, there are then limitations, for example, like criminal records or, or certain private, uh, certain information is not, uh, doesn't in, include in that, but um, those are like exceptions. So the key point is really to enable this. And 
uh, if you want to really understand more of uh, of this topic, there's this concept of my data. Uh, it's then a more architectural and conceptual, very long. Uh, I think it's already like five years uh, of overall development, and this is an open standard concept. Uh, so from all around the world, different actors uh, contribute for this development. So this really looks at this uh, user data, not only from technical perspective, but also from ethical perspective, uh, legal perspective, uh, uh, individuals benefits perspective, uh, and, and design perspective and so forth. So there's a lot of to, to explore from that. And <clears throat> the, the concept for the ecosystem uh, data, we have ecosystem OS. And then for user side, we have the concept circle pass and the application, applications around that. And the circle pass is a global user account. Uh, and again, global means that it's, uh, it's not tied to any one application, but it's an, a user account that is meant to work independently. But, but it's also not a user account that we operate. Uh, this service can be set up to operate by any operator in any country in the in the ecosystem, and this global user account from one operator can be moved under another operator, like a individual moving from country to country. They need to be able to bring their data and identity with them, uh, and then be served by another operator. Because the key here around is also the, the data model that makes that possible and the connectivities that are structured around that. So that account holds users aggregated and most complete data about them. And it's whether it's individual or an entity like a startup uh, in account where users are in full control of their access, connections, portability, privacy levels and so forth. So it, it includes the signing possibility uh, for identity uh, to secure and protect users' data ownership so that they can make decisions about their data <coughs> and, uh, and, and really several different uh, key aspects. Enable users to centrally manage, enable users to collect their own personal data, enable users to manage, synchronize, analyze, uh, attach and connect relevant KPIs to KPI dashboards. So basically, of course, Circle Pass being an application itself can then feed the ecosystem OS uh, for statistical data and, and, and so forth. But there needs to be an application that is that uh, shared users and shared users' data, but under users on control, regardless of the application. So not an extension like Facebook login or Google login. It's just an extension of their own one application to harvest even more data, what the user does outside of their, their own application. They are not the same from the perspective uh, of uh, having uh, a neutral local operator operating a user account for a citizen uh, that then can take that account into another country if they move and they can use it in the multiple applications. Um, how and who is operating that account is a local decision public-private partnership, operating under mandate, at, at local regulation and so forth. Again, separating the technology, separating the responsibilities from the technical solutions and concepts that we create. But communicating how these are done, how they can be put in place. So the Circle Pass Global User Account is a service to enable managing users' data and enable users' control and use of their data by their terms, not a central data storage. And then looking at uh, the data model, so coming back and connecting this into the, the, the most core piece, regardless of being historical, monotonic application, whether being future oriented, whether it's user side, whether it's the infrastructure side, uh, the data model is the most uh, flexible, yet most powerful uh, commons that we can have to help bring the connectivity, the 
because it doesn't take into account whether APIs exist or doesn't exist. It doesn't take into account what software languages are used. It doesn't take into account what database models or data uh, bases are used. It just looks the structure of information. So uh, it has also other terms like database model is then more specific to database and content model is just a different word uh, for data. But basically uh, here's a good way to say a content model documents all the different types of content you will have for a given project. It contains detailed definitions of its content type elements and their relationship to each other. So it's what information is, how it's structured, uh, how it connects with different uh, pieces of that information. And that data model then goes into the systems. So system integration, simple interfaces, minimum redundancy of data, compatible data and then eventually to orchestration, its value creation, increased efficiencies, increased effectiveness, reduced risks, reduced costs. So this is how the data model contributes uh, step by step. And there's many other cases around as well. And this basically gives a, a view into ecosystem application types and key information uh, in a visualized format. So this is uh, very extensive, so I'm not going to you know, go into detail, but the key point here is to uh, open up a little bit, categorize the, the different types of applications. So we have like portals are typically having public information uh, where they have the data is people profiles, organization profiles, service information, uh, and uh, development initiatives. So very much public information. Then we have member-based. So we have communities, we have like meetup groups, we have Facebook groups, we have uh, membership um, applications where again, people profiles, organization profiles, but they are no longer public per se. They are public among the members or not. We have private entries. So these are again, places where we have people profiles, but now it's CRM. So uh, it's people profiles, but actually from a perspective that we have information about people, but those people whose profiles they are, they don't have access to that information. It's on the service side. <clears throat> and again, we have people and organization. And then we have private use tools. So we have tools, apps like our own email or you know some planning tool, uh, and there also is the user accounts in minimum and uh, the organization user accounts, but those are private on the user side, not on the service side, where CRM is uh, private on the service side, including users' information, but the user themselves don't have access to that. And these are the application categories, and uh, then there are data connections. Uh, in different ways you have user account application and then you have key information that you can pull from this. So we have circle paths, you have access rights um, and then people user profiles, notifications, what's happening and, and so forth. And then on the application side you have application specific data so this is looking at what type of uh, information there is about users in what types of applications and then application itself have the service side specific data uh, that is recorded like the KPIs and so forth. And, and then who is maintaining uh, that information? So uh, in the portal, typically it's a portal host, so ecosystem organization who is hosting that portal. In a membership is the community organization, so if it's a meetup group, then who is the admin of that meetup group? Uh, if it's a CRM, it's the service organization. And if it's a private use, it's the user themselves who maintain that uh, information. But now, 
when you think about uh, that user information in different systems and connecting them into one user account, it's very clear that you cannot, without having a separate account to connect to, that you can't really connect these profiles together because they serve a different purpose. Every one of them include information, for example, about me, so my tools, CRM record of the service I went to, a membership site, and a portal, uh, but they are not the same. So information about me, but from a different perspective for different use. And then there are other ways of how the data entry can come. It can be automated, crowdsourced, open suggestions like Wikipedia is something that uh, someone contributes for it, someone improves it, but it's not necessarily um, uh, or like uh, the crunch space includes information about com companies and startups, but they can also be added by others than the owners of those. Uh, it's like similar than Wikipedia approach. So, and, and then the key information to look at in, uh, in the, those who host the system, they look at KPI statuses, then there the content is more posts, activities, and then on the top there are access rights. And all of this information is of course dynamic and on the circle side, uh, circle path side, it's uh, meant to be uh, private, like a tool, tool like, except uh, separately when decide, decided to, to share per permission. And when we look at the data model, uh, we have data model categories. So we, in ecosystem context, uh, we have people and entities, we have support services and activities, we have development initiatives and projects, we have KPIs and reporting, and then we have content model groups. So we have listed data and we have old data. So we have profiles in like CRM type of uh, info and then something where I created that. And then function focus segments is uh, building companies. So these are uh, business builders providing support functions. So these are the support providers. And then we have ecosystem management and development that's ecosystem development and orchestration. And then we have the digital side, the tools. So basically those, those who need to collaborate to find, uh, the, 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 to contribute for the open standard data model from business uh, perspective or non-technical perspective. And then main data contents to model, again, users and entities. Uh, KPI, so these are from the data model categories, uh, ecosystem management purposes, automated portal, uh, like building a portal out of the aggregated data from multiple systems. Uh, and just some, some examples here. And other data content types to model, activity feeds, notifications, scores, projects, events. Uh, and so forth. And the types of tools uh, to use can be like business plan tools, project management tools, blogs, uh, content management system, design tools, Google Drives, and, and, and so forth. So here's a visualization about the data model. So uh, it really is the common denominator whether it's a monotonic application, whatever the application is, uh, serverless, it all requires to have data model and data modeling, uh, a common denominator in all types of ways of handling and sharing data. Whether it's for designing new applications and databases, for collecting and storing research data, for API design, development and use, for sharing data manually in spreadsheet or in any other format for that matter. And here is just to give a context of totally different types of use case. So this is a data model attrib with attributes for painting, paintings on loan. 
So just to give a, a totally different analogy to just to understand the logic and function of a data model. So this is done more, it's not the complete, this is just a tiny piece of a data model to, to visualize it. Um, here's a very uh, a kind of a specific use case outside of ecosystem for analogy to help build understanding of how to structure data model. And <clears throat> if you want to play around with uh, an application to build a data model, uh, or you can look at how to do that, you can uh, use tool, you can register a free account. Uh, we are not associated with Contentful, it's just a good tool. Uh, to learn and design content models from a user interface uh, perspective. So it's a SaaS tool for meant for uh, various different use cases, but it is uh, fitting to, to looking at how a designing a data model uh, can be. And of course, because of that, they have extensive uh, educational content and material available there. And this can uh, also, that solution can work for small, smaller scale uh, data sharing needs between different applications without connecting directly into one application. And uh, of course, we are happy to discuss and, and in, in more detail as well, but we want to share this in part of this content so that you can also consume yourself, you can test yourself, you can practice yourself, you can you know, look related YouTube videos and so forth to get conceptual understanding and more practical level, even if it's not necessarily applicable into a ecosystem level production person solution. So the key thing really to understand about digital transformation, <clears throat> because we talk about big things, we talk about global things, ecosystem level things, multiple applications and so forth. Um, and the, but we talk about in a way with the common language, with common approach, with common understanding, we can solve these things together uh, as long as there's commitment to doing so. And if uh, organizing the ecosystem activities on the right governance model and doing that with a long-term commitment. So all is not lost for the digital world, for the you know five leading global companies. There is things that can be done and can be done from bottom-up actions combined with top-down actions at national level with existing technologies and solutions uh, as long as getting the right people with right motivations, uh, existing budget used now in different ways, reapplying same budgets to do uh, more digitally oriented ways with the same cost or similar cost level just with the improved knowledge and uh, more cost-effective uh, latest solutions, it's all doable. But it's an iterative process, so it's really to get back and look from a data perspective and really looking at what data do we want to capture and, uh, and then how many uh, applications are we capturing that from. So what information? and from what sources and taking like certain data at a time and really moving that progress systematically over the years in the ecosystem to capture more and more, to cover more and more of the ecosystem with the shared uh, open standard models. And uh, of course, with step by step and with accumulated learning, this process can be accelerated uh, but the key is to understand the key technologies, the, the holistic big picture, what you need to complete, get moving and keep moving. 